While I make every effort to broadcast correct information, I'm also still learning. I will double check all my facts, but realize that healthcare is a constantly changing science and art. One doctor or healthcare provider may have a different way of doing things from another. I welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. I take no money from supplement or device companies. By listening to this podcast or reading this blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice or to treat any medical condition, neither yourself or others including but not limited to patients that you are treating. Consult your healthcare provider for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to the podcast or the website. Under no circumstances shall any guests or contributors to the podcast or blog or any employees, associates, or affiliates of the Boss Body podcast be responsible for damages arising from use of the podcast or the blog. This blog or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limiting to, limited to establishing the standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or the blog. What's up, guys? It's Dr. Tim Jackson with another episode of the Boss Body Podcast. Back pain elbow pain, knee pain, we've all had some sort of musculoskeletal pain, whether it's from being a weekend warrior or we had a car accident or something of that nature. But oftentimes the site of pain and the source of the pain are two very different areas. And if you go to a surgeon, they typically have two things to offer you. Surgery, of course, and cortisone injections. And it, if you've had low back surgery or lumbar surgery, you know that oftentimes you'll need a revision in five years. And oftentimes the pain will get worse. There are other options. I wanted to bring in a subject matter expert who does this on a day in and day out basis, Dr. Drew Timmermans. Welcome to the show, Dr. Drew. Thanks for having me, Dr. Tim. Yeah, so you're the real Dr. Drew, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what got you interested. Like, obviously you were interested in integrative health, but specifically what got you interested in musculoskeletal health? Yeah, so um, I was an athlete in undergrad. I ran track and field, so 400, 600 meters uh, was kind of my specialty. And through that, I always enjoyed learning anatomy, physiology, that type of stuff. My undergrad was in kinesiology. Uh, and so just all that is anatomy has always just fascinated me. Um, but then um, after undergrad, I was in a car accident uh, and then uh, two weeks later, I tweaked my back in the gym doing some squats, you know, just kind of two, three days where it's a little stiff moving around, stuff like that. And then a few weeks after that um, was doing some repeat 800 meters, which is terrible in and of itself. Yeah. But um, I uh, was on my second last rep and I felt my discs herniate. It's the, it was the weirdest feeling in the world. I felt them herniate. It was a pop. It was intense, intense pain. Like I felt my core deactivate, weird sensation. Next day, woke up and I could barely walk. Also, didn't help that it was like January up in Canada. So it's cold, it's cold season. So I'm like sneezing and coughing and stuff. And anyone who's had a disc herniation knows that coughing and sneezing will take you to your knees in an acute event. And so that really started this whole journey of trying to understand my pain, my back pain. Um, it eventually led me to actually getting my first PRP injections. I had uh, eventually moved from Canada to Arizona. So I escaped the Canadian winters. And at this point I was in second year med school. And I still had chronic low back pain. Obviously my acute disc stuff was gone, um, but I still had some lingering stuff going into the leg a ton of just like back discomfort, couldn't really uh, get comfortable in, in chairs in school and stuff like that. And so I went to a sports med conference because I was still interested in sports medicine and they had lectures on PRP. And then they're actually doing some demonstrations on PRP injections. So I got diagnosed at the conference. I got injected at the conference. And three months later, for the first time in two years, I was pain-free. And I was like... Nice holy cow, like this is, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my career is 
this regenerative medicine stuff. And so I, you know, dove deep into prolotherapy, PRP. A few years later, got really interested in stem cell therapy, and that led me to where I am today. Awesome. And you actually did a residency in regenerative medicine at the Rorden, how do you say it, Rorden Clinic? Reorden. Reorden Clinic. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about that and what you took away from, was it two, three years? Yeah. So it was a one-year residency. Um, it was the first time that this residency has been offered. So uh, our med school, which is now Sonoran University of Health Sciences, used to be Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. So when I graduated, it was Southwest. Um, but they were planning on starting this regenerative medicine uh, residency program. And so I was actually the first person to go through it. And so because it was in the beginning stages, the first time they offered it, it was only a one-year residency. Now it's expanded out into a two-year residency. Um, and then um, there are a few other clinics across the country who have uh, similar regenerative injection, regenerative medicine residencies that vary between one and three years. The one that we currently have in our clinic, like I have a resident under me, uh, his is a three-year program because we are just, we're building it out a little bit more. But, you know, that residency was, I mean, really, really eye-opening. And so it was, it was nice because... Um, my residency director, so my attending physician was an anesthesiologist who did interventional pain procedures. So 90% of what we did was we injected spine. So cervical, thoracic, uh, lumbar, sacral, and, uh, and then like kind of, you know, just the other peripheral stuff for, for joints. And all of it was x-ray guided because that's generally standard of care in the allopathic world. And um, it was a high volume clinic because he did work with um, both insurance and non-insurance patients. So just got a ton of hands-on experience on, you know, uh, uh, at safely and adequately treating patients predominantly with spine related issues. And then because of my personal history with back pain, you know, just that's really where my deep dive into, you know, treating lumbar pathology really came in was my experience layered on top of the fact that probably 65% of the patients we saw had, had low back pain and we were treating them for that. And so um, learned a lot of the conventional based stuff and did a lot of the conventional based stuff uh, with that. But then also it was a, a great clinic in the sense that we had the ability to offer PRP, prolotherapy, bone marrow, and that type of stuff, the regenerative stuff for the patients who were sick and tired of doing the steroids and the radio frequency ablations and all that stuff, or they wanted to try to avoid surgery and stuff like that. And so uh, got trained in uh, bone marrow aspiration and then eventually got trained in the uh, small volume liposuction for the adipose tissue stem cell procedures. And really just, I mean, I learned so much in that residency. Well, that's awesome. Um, that's unique. Were you the first naturopathic doctor to go through the residency? Um, that This specific residency, yes. There's one other residency that was up in the Pacific Northwest um, at another clinic that a colleague, uh, that it was a regenerative medicine based residency as well. Um, and he, I think he graduated, uh, finished his residency either the same year I did, it was a very short amount of time, but essentially him and I are kind of like the two first ones to have a formal regenerative medicine residency. Well, that's awesome. You and I were talking before we began recording about, you know, we've all heard of people and, you know, I've had patients who come in and they say, well, I saw, I had an appointment with a surgeon and he said, if, you know, if I don't have the surgery, I'm going to be in a wheelchair and six months to a year or, you know, something drastic like that. Let's talk about how, you know, imaging, x-rays, MRIs, et cetera, how you can see abnormalities on there. And that may not be what's causing your pain and discomfort. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the most the, the biggest things that I love talking about is this distinction of what I call a uh, an imaging diagnosis and a pain generating diagnosis. Sometimes those things match up, what we call concordant. Sometimes they don't match up and they're discordant. And so um, the imaging diagnosis is, okay, what are the structural changes that a radiologist is going to point out and call out and any good trained radiologist or any good trained surgeon will be able to look at that x-ray MRI and go, Yes, you have facet hypertrophy. Yes, you've got ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. Yes, you've got a bulge disc, a annular fissure, stenosis, whatever it is, right? It's just 
what does this picture, what changes from the normal are happening? The pain generating diagnosis takes it a step further and says, okay, fine, cool, great, but what things are, is your brain perceiving as painful? We can, so I'll give you a, a great example. So with my whole story on having chronic back pain, throughout the years, I've re-injured my back a few times because I like to stay active. I like to lift weights. I like to run. And so I've herniated two discs. And so they're naturally weaker. They're more likely to get injured. And so I've re-injured them a few times. Um, I underwent what's called an intradiscal PRP injection uh, about seven months ago. So my former attending physician, he put PRP inside of the two discs that I herniated and have, and still at that point had annular fissures in. So four, five and five, one. And, um, you know, our pre MRI showed that, yes, I still had the herniations. Thankfully, because of the, the things that I'd done, they hadn't really progressed in about six years. Uh, but they were still there. And I was, I mean, the uh, prior to getting that, my pain was, you know, on average, three to four out of 10, uh, and just not something I wanted to deal with. Currently, I'm 95 to 100% better, depending on the day, I might have a little mild ache, you know, at the end of a procedure day after wearing lead and being on my feet all day and stuff like that. But outside that, I'm back to the lifting in the gym, I have no ridiculous leg symptoms, none of that. I bet you a million dollars if we took an MRI of my back right now, I still have two herniated discs. Those discs did not get repaired to perfect, right. pristine, you know, uh, really nice and bright on a, uh, on a on an MRI. They're still going to look probably identical. Now, does that does that matter? Well, some might argue, okay, yes, but also I'm I'm not in pain, and. Right. I still have that image finding. And so if I, if a surgeon looked at that, they'd go, yeah, you should probably fuse it or you should probably go into a little micro disectomy and get rid of that stuff. How you must have symptoms and I'm symptom free. And so awesome. that just shows that we can sometimes, and it's, it's very often, especially in the low back where we can have these changes on MRI and the biggest things are going to be changes in the discs that are not causing any symptoms. And the only way you can know that is if you have a skilled clinician, it does not have to be a physician, it could be a physical therapist, athletic therapist, occupational therapist, doesn't matter, skilled clinician who is able to listen to the story of the patient. It hurts when I do this. It makes uh, it better if I do this. To take that and then perform a physical assessment where we're actively trying to put stress and strain through different tissues and we use like... 30 different things to triangulate what it all means because there's no one perfect single test right. in order to say, hey, I think your disc is causing your pain or I think your facet joints are causing your pain. I don't care what your imaging says. And so both are, are super important. But if I could only do one thing, if, if some weird universal thing happened or I couldn't do one of those things anymore, I'd say I don't need imaging. I would use physical exam day in and day out, because that will get me closer more often than just relying on imaging alone. Yeah. And that's a, those are all great points. And one thing, or one question I wanted to pose to you is the role of soft tissue imbalances, trigger points, adhesions, et cetera. So back in 2011, I did the active release technique spinal portion. Nice. And I was, I still had a physical office at that time. I was working in a physical office and I was getting great results. And, you know, they talked to us during the course. I mean, I learned it in school, but it didn't really hit you, but you know, the paraspinal muscles are vertically oriented. And since they can only shorten over time, you're going to get compression of the disc. What role do soft tissue contractures or maybe not contractures, but trigger points play in musculoskeletal dysfunction? Yeah, that's a, uh... I, I have a little bit of a different view on trigger points than most people. And um, how do I frame this up well? So in med school, we used to treat a lot of trigger points. We did trigger point therapy. So whether it was, you know, um, dry needling, uh, we also just did some, uh, we're also trained in, in some TCM stuff. So gua sha, scraping, okay. cupping, that type of stuff, all for trigger points. We would do trigger point injections with local anesthetics to try to get it to calm down um, and then just manual work. 
and that did work for a lot of patients. Um, but we had a bunch of patients where it just, it seemed that we would do this and it would get them better for about a week and then it would come back and then we would do it again and it would get a week. And it's this cycle of just like, hey, we just continually need to do this, this trigger point work. And in the people where, you know, you do a few treatments for trigger points and the trigger points get better, the trigger points go away and you don't have to keep addressing them. I tend to view those as more like, okay, that's the traditional primary trigger point issue. You know, right. you, can, you can work on those, resolve them, they go away, they don't come back, great. These are the patients where people are just like, oh, I just, I need to go to my massage therapist or I need to see my acupuncturist or whatever it is to deal with those trigger points. Mm -hmm. There's usually an underlying root cause there. The two biggest things that I see is going to be joint instability and um, neurogenic inflammation, which may not be the, the best term, but essentially where the nerves that are innervating those muscles are not functioning properly. And because of that, you're getting in a vicious cycle where you have increased hypertonicity of the muscle, which then actually restricts blood flow to the nerves. And that restriction of blood flow to the nerves then causes Dys dysfunctional firing of the muscles. And so now you get, the, and it's this vicious cycle. And so in, in those patients I was talking about in med school, uh, we started treating their nerves with just subcutaneous 5% dextrose treatment. It's called perineural injection therapy or lift off mm -hmm. perineural technique. Um, and those patients, two or three treatments, trigger points gone and they don't come back. And pain goes away with it. It's not just like, oh, I still have pain, but we're like, oh, we don't feel it. No, like pain goes away. And um, the actual trigger point on palpation goes away and stayed gone. And wow. so I think in those situations, um, it was important for us to look one step deeper and go, okay, we have these trigger points, but something is causing those trigger points and the trigger points are just a symptom. And how can we address that? And I think neurogenic inflammation and, and treatment of, of the nerves is crucial there in, in a lot of patients. But the other one is just joint instability we see this so often in the cervical spine in patients who have whiplash injuries. Mm -hmm. You get this whiplash injury, you get a micro tearing and some instability of the capsules of the facet joints. Sometimes you'll see this in the interspinous ligament and the nuchal ligament. And then what happens is the cervical paraspinal muscles are going to contract in order to help provide stability to the cervical spine. Our body cares so much about our nervous system and protecting right. our brain and spinal cord, that it is going to do whatever it needs to, to keep you as stable as it physically can to the point where you are suffering in pain all the time. Same with low back disc injuries, right? We can sometimes, I know acutely, we see a multifidi that are shutting down after an acute disc injury, but chronically we see those paraspinals just become super taut. And it's just this, this way that the body is saying, Hey, I don't like this micro instability that I have in the spine. So I'm going to, uh, to lock all of this down. And like you mentioned in doing so, you can get more compression. So you can get some foraminal stenosis. You are now getting uh, a reduction in the amount of water and nutrition that's going into the disc because it's not having this compression and relaxation effect. And so, yeah, trigger points um, can, can both be caused by those things, but also can cause issues with those things. Yeah, I definitely agree. I see some people that are, you know, addressing trigger points like over and over and over for, you know, a year and a half, two years. And I can somewhat understand, you know, if someone's like a triathlete or a marathon runner and, you know, they're doing repetitive motions. But, you know, even in those cases, I think looking at the entire kinetic chain. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I had a patient and he had hip and no, he had. Yeah, he had hip pain and I was working on, or excuse me, he had knee pain and I was working on the whole kinetic chain. And so he goes for a follow-up with the orthopedic surgeon and he told him kind of what we were doing. And he's like, well, why is this guy working on your hip? <laughs> and I said, well, I drew a little diagram and I said, what's that bone? He's like, femur. I said, what about that bone? Femur. I was like, oh, so if I move one end, then the other end's got to move. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like with the knee it's caught in the middle with nowhere to go. And yeah. if you look at NBA players with the high top shoes, when they got introduced, the rate of knee injuries kind of went through the roof. Mm -hmm. What role does assessing the kinetic chain play in your treatment? Good question. Um, 
In my specific approaches, it is a little bit less than in the physical therapy world. My role as uh, someone who does uh, interventional procedures is I am trying to find what tissues are currently painful and what tissues are uh, maybe overstretched or have structural damage that's contributing to pain and then putting a needle into those tissues to then try and strengthen those tissues. And so um, where the fascial chain or the kinetic chain comes into play is when we say, okay, look, the way that your ankle is moving or how the, the bones in your feet are not moving, they don't have good joint play, that's causing increased stress through the inside of your knee joint, which is tearing down on your meniscus. That's why you've got some pain from the meniscus and, and the meniscofemoral ligaments. And so I'm going to treat the things that are causing you pain but then I need you to go to physical therapy because those are the people who are absolutely fantastic at building programs that include mobility, that include um, stretching, which is separate from mobility, that's going to include strength training, that's going to start to incorporate a fascial chain, kinetic chain type approach. Um, yeah. We've had a few cases where, you know, somebody, uh, I'm trying to give a good example. Uh, somebody has, let's say, um, they've got pain, uh, lateral knee pain, that seems to be the proximal tib-fib joint. So that proximal tib-fib joint is, is moving a lot, and it's really, really painful when they're running. All right, we do an ankle assessment, and they've rolled their ankle 30 times in their life, right? And they've just, their ATFL is just shot. It is just super loose, but they have no pain there, but they just always roll it. Well, that is a direct kinetic link that I will then go and I will treat the ATFL because we know that that ligament's loose. I look at it under ultrasound. It's big, it's fat, it's swollen, like it's not doing its job well. We'll go in and treat that with PRP or stem cell therapy as a, as a way to try to say like, okay, physical therapy is not the best at helping to restore ligaments to their original length. The best thing that we have right now outside of you know, a surgeon going in and taking two ends and putting back together is the PRP and stem cell therapy. And so let's do the injection for the ATFL. Let's treat the proximal tib-fib joint in order to help with the lateral knee pain. And then you're going to go to physical therapy and they're going to work on the whole kinetic chain. So that's kind of how we have incorporated this, you know, not just it hurts here. So I'm just going to inject here, right. but looking at the big picture. Absolutely. And uh, one thing you mentioned about the ATFL got me thinking about, you know, high ankle sprains and professional sports, and you hear these timelines, and I'm not thinking, well, it really depends on what you're doing during that time, right? You know, if you have a class four laser, someone like yourself doing regenerative injections, then that timeline becomes much, much shorter. Mm -hmm. I know, so I had, he's in Arizona, actually, Doug Grant, he was the first nutritionist in the National Basketball Association. Nice. And he said, you know, back in, I think the early eighties, early to mid eighties, uh, when he first went on, I think with the Phoenix Suns, and then he was with the Miami heat, but at the time he couldn't make any recommendation that the rest of the medical team didn't agree with. <laughs> and I thought, man, well, they're going to disagree with everything I say. Um, but luckily the owners hired him and they liked him. And so he's like, you know, I'll prove to you that what I'm doing works. And he would show them, you know, noticeable changes in biomarkers and blood work, et cetera. Have you had uh, or do you treat a lot of athletes? And what is your opinion on, you know, the dogmatic approach of orthopedic surgery only in professional sports? I see a lot of that. Yeah. So really good question. Um, uh, athletes are a smaller minority of our patient population. And that is primarily just because the, I think the, the system for the athletes is so heavy ingrained towards, you know, th that orthopedic pathway. And you also do have uh, a lot of orthopedic surgeons now who are doing some regenerative therapies and things like that. And so our practice is probably, I'll say in terms of, uh, minor league or uh, major league players is going to be less than 5%. Um, and then kind of our, the, the remainder 95 is your weekend warriors, or you're just your average person who's just, you know, suffering in chronic pain. I think the hard part with, uh, with the orthobiologics of the PRP and stem cell therapy is 
there still has not been enough research to show that, okay, when we do this in an athletic population, so, you know, you look at something like um, a partial, uh, a partial tear of the supraspinatus in an overhead throwing athlete. Okay. You look at that and go, okay, let's say they've, they failed conservative management. They've done everything and they're considering, you know, getting, getting a repair. We don't yet have the data to say in the overhead throwing athlete, if you do this dose of platelets or this dose of stem cells, you have 80% of the people of the athletes who go on to return to their level of play and avoid surgery. You have uh, 20% who don't, and they progress to surgery. We don't have that data. And so a lot of athletes, because the medical team is, is kind of having these discussions with them, they're saying, look, if you have this surgery, you've got a, I don't know the stat on a, on a rotator cuff repair, but let's say it's, you know, 70% chance that you're going to return to the same level of play. And do you want to take that? Yes or no. And then they decide from that. So, so we just don't have that data. And we have had some, uh, some players come through who are kind of like, Hey, like, you know, there's people who don't know that I'm doing this because they're fed up with the way that they're just saying, no, just go, you have to go get the surgery. You have to go get the surgery. And they're like, look, I'm just taking this into my own hands. I'm going to go spend my own money. I'm going to go, going to go do my own thing. And we're just, you know, I'm not going to tell them what I'm doing because I, because they believe, and then we have a good informed discussion that, Hey, there's a chance that we could actually help you avoid surgery for something that, you know, is minor and, and stuff like that. And so, you know, I think the, the ultimate Holy grail in all of sports medicine for athletics, I think is if there's a study that shows that a certain percentage of patients can avoid a Tommy John's with doing regenerative therapies and not having surgery. Like, I, I feel like that's when finally everybody will get on board and be like, okay, mm -hmm. this PRP stuff can work. Because it's the number one surgery that's done, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I want to go back to something you said a few minutes ago when you were talking about the lumbar paraspinals becoming hypertonic. You know, gluteal amnesia, your butt goes to sleep, your hamstrings are overactive. You talk about hamstring pulls in athletes, especially like the NFL combine coming up in a couple mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the lumbar paraspinals become hypertonic, the hamstrings become hypertonic, and they're working overtime and the glutes. Um, you know, are asleep. And the hamstrings are really the only thing connected to the ischial tuberosity and stabilizing the pelvis. Um, what role does your injections and the regenerative injections play in hamstring strains? Yeah. So, if we have a uh, if we have something happening at the uh, the insertion of the hamstrings onto the ischial tuberosity, so let's say we have a partial thickness tear there, um, you know, not a full thickness. Um, or if it, even if it is full thickness and we don't have any retraction of those hamstring tendons, that can be a great place where we can look at using either PRP or stem cell therapy to help support the natural healing process that the body is already trying to do. When we start getting into the um, kind of more muscle belly hamstring tears, mm -hmm. those are a little bit tougher. And part of the reason, I shouldn't say tougher, I should just say, we have to change our approach a little bit because the predominant injection that was done in the past was PRP injections directly into the tear and things like that. And there's some emerging literature coming out saying that, hey, maybe when we do these PRP injections into the hamstring tear, we actually might be causing something called uh, heterotopic ossification, or basically you're getting bone deposition into that muscle and or a lot of fibrosis into that muscle tissue. And so they, they, you know, looked at a large population of athletes and said, okay, who had injections of PRP in the hamstring tear? What's the prevalence of those two things? Okay, it's higher than the average person. So maybe there's, you know, something to it there. And so the switch then is not to use PRP, but to use the other part of the plasma, the platelet poor plasma, which is going to have growth factors that are present in it, but not the platelets because we think it's the platelets and the specific the TGF beta, which is in super high levels in PRP that's stimulating kind of this like overproduction of stuff in the muscle. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at the literature on like return to play. But if I vaguely remember, um, there was one study that showed, hey, you know, when you do PRP injections, this study, I think, was from like 2016, 
2018 era. But hey, you know, you might have a little bit faster return to play with, uh, you know, PRP injections for hamstring tears and stuff like that. You know, so we've got some some evidence there. There's, there's there is a lack of evidence in this acute stage of injury. Most of the research for PRP and stem cell therapy is in your uh, chronic injuries, right? It, it's it's the athlete who's like, okay, this hamstring tear should have healed six weeks ago or at six weeks, right? And it's now been six months and I still have pain when I squat or when I'm running over the hurdle or whatever it is. And that's where we're like, okay, the body hasn't done a good job at, at healing that area. Let's go back in with some PRP or some stem cells. Let's trigger the body to go through a new healing response, which is one of the big things that these injections do. And then that's where we see uh, the best results. You incorporate um, hormone testing, microbiome testing, any of the functional medicine type wellness testing to create an anti-inflammatory profile and to increase someone's anabolic potential? In some patients, yes. Um, so we used to do a lot more of it. And over time, as my practice has grown, I have just chosen to start to really specialize in, hey, I, I'm just the injection guy. If right. you want someone who is like, that's all I do, then, you know, let's work together type deal. <clears throat> in the practice, though, my wife, uh, my wife and I own the practice together. She's also a naturopathic doctor. She kind of handles all of the internal medicine type stuff. So whether it's hormones, whether it's gut stuff, whether it's uh, uh, neurological, so some neuroinflammation stuff, chronic infections, all those things. And so if we have a patient who comes in, and we believe, because I'm still trained in kind of assessing all that, if I go, hey, I think that, you know, you should probably get your hormones tested, you should do this, 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 I'll refer over to her. She'll work on that side of the equation while I will work on my side of the equation. And we kind of tag team these things together, um, which I think works out best for the patient because that's what she specializes in. That's what I specialize in. And then we have this, um, you know, uh, really nice blend of the two. And, and truthfully, you know, a lot of those things can be extremely, extremely important. There are some providers out there, though, I think that maybe place a little bit too much weight into that, into, you know, make sure the patient's perfect before they get a PRP injection. But then they're still suffering in pain for six months while they're optimizing everything. Mm -hmm. And so we like, you know, making sure that, hey, let's get you some pain relief. Let's, let's do an injection while you're working on the other things. Um, but I have had a few patients where I say, hey, you know, if you're looking at doing a stem cell procedure because of your age, because of the type of tissue damage you have, because of, uh, you know, the outcomes you want and, and you're okay pay paying that amount of money for that, um, it would be smart to spend three months getting you a little bit healthier before we do this. And most right. of them will say, oh, that's awesome. Great. Let's do it. You know, and they can tolerate, you know, the pain for another three months while they're improving their blood sugar you know, uh, boosting up their testosterone or their growth hormone or whatever it is that, you know, kind of needs to be done to help put them into a better healing state. Awesome. Well, it sounds like the patients are lucky to have you guys looking at everything because that's really unique. I mean, normally you have to go here and then there and then there and, you know, fly here, drive there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's awesome. Uh, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to see if you could give the viewers and listeners a general overview of the types of stem cells and then tell us about the ones that you use. Yeah. So um, in general, the, the, so the stem cells I'm mainly going to talk about, cause that's what I keep up with in the literature are our adult stem cells. Those are not the embryonic. Those are not, you know, the stuff that's made in the lab and all of those things. Um, there's uh, those are not really done. Those, they're not done in the U.S. in in humans, and so we won't talk about anything that is uh, embryonic. So our adult stem cells, we kind of have uh, two major ones. That's our mesenchymal stem cell, which is the stem cell that in our bodies has the ability to differentiate into our connective tissues, muscle, bone, tendon, all those types of things. And then we have our hematopoietic stem cell, which is the, the stem cell that becomes our white blood cells and, and all of those uh, types of things. And so when we do the procedures that we do, which is a bone marrow aspiration or a mini liposuction procedure, we're getting a little bit of both of those. When we do a bone marrow aspiration, 
we are going to get a uh, a moderate amount of mesenchymal stem cells that are present in the bone marrow, and we're going to get a large number of hematopoietic stem cells that are present in the bone marrow. When we do a uh, lipo aspiration or mini liposuction procedure, we're going to get a much higher amount of mesenchymal stem cells um, compared to bone marrow, but we're going to get a lot, a lot lower hematopoietic stem cells. Now, what's really interesting is, so the, um, the, the doctor, the researcher who discovered the mesenchymal stem cell, his name is Arnie Kaplan. He recently passed away, which is a huge hit to the field. But he um, had a paper back in, I think, 2015 that really talked about how these stem cells, when they take them and they put them into a Petri dish, they can make them turn into tendon, ligament, white blood cell, red blood cell, all of those lines. And so for a long time, it was believed that, oh, when we take your bone marrow and we have those stem cells and we inject it into your knee joint, those stem cells are going to turn into cartilage. And that is absolutely not what happens. There are a few small studies that show that maybe a tiny portion, like 0.1% of the cells that are injected will actually go through that process where they will become a cartilage cell or a disc cell or things like that. But mostly what's happening is those stem cells, both the mesenchymal and the hematopoietic, are signaling molecules. They go into an environment and they go, holy cow, this is really inflamed. We got to do something about this. And then they start to orchestrate a healing response. So they will send out packets of cellular information to tell other cells, hey, I need you to upregulate this gene. Hey, let's downregulate that gene. I need you to make these proteins. Let's make these peptides. The stem cells also secrete a whole bunch of uh, cytokines and peptides and growth factors as a way to also help that tissue environment. And so when we collect the bone marrow or the adipose tissue, what we're essentially doing is we're collecting these cells that have the ability to deliver cell biocellular medicine to your own cells that then can help to re-kickstart a new healing process, which is where we get uh, reduction in pain, reduction in inflammation, improvement in activities of daily living, and in some patients, that stimulus is strong enough and the patient is healthy enough that we actually can see tissue healing, which is the ultimate goal of all of these things. Um, in some people's eyes, I kind of tend to think the ultimate goal is just get people to enjoy life, right? Again, back right. to our discussion earlier on, okay, if you have a disc herniation, but you have no pain your whole life, who cares, right? right? And so, yes, yeah, so those are the types of stem cells that are predominantly used here in the U.S., Awesome. And what changes do you see coming in the next five to 10 years in regenerative medicine? And, you know, there's obviously a lot of you know FDA cracking down on stem cells type thing, not because they've hurt anyone, but because, you know, the politics behind it. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah. So I don't, I wish I had a crystal ball and can tell you where, you know, uh, where things were going. Um, you know, I am a I'm a big believer in the body's ability to heal and that we have the things inside us that um, can help us heal in ratios that I think are important. And so where I hope the field doesn't go is where we move to kind of what we're seeing outside the U.S., which is where, OK, in a vial you can get a hundred million mesenchymal stem cells and you can, you know, inject that uh, in and, and that's going to do X, Y, or Z. I hope it doesn't move to that because there are so many things that are present in bone marrow and adipose tissue more than just the mesenchymal stem cells and the hematopoietic stem cells. There's growth factors, there's cytokines, there's proteins, there's peptides. There's all these fantastic things that can help tissue healing in one way or another. Now, I will say there does seem to be some emerging evidence out of Europe that once you hit a certain number of stem cells in an injection, these are stem cells from a vial, mesenchymal stem cells, where they're taken from a donor, they're grown in a lab, they're expanded, and now you have the ability to inject 20 to 300 million of these things. There does appear to be some true tissue regeneration in things like the Achilles tendon. I may change my opinion if 
we can see that, hey, the ability to do that is actually better and, and safe in a patient. I think where uh, I'll get more comfortable with that is, which I think this would be really cool, is if we can take stem cells from a patient and then they can expand those in the lab. So Dr. Tim, we could take your bone marrow, it goes off to a lab, they expand out your stem cells such that you can come back in and when your knee's bugging you when you're 82, we can put 100 million stem cells inside your knee and that gives you pain relief for 10 years, right? And maybe it helps delay the progression of your arthritis or it reverses at that point, who knows? But I personally like when my stuff gets put back into me and when I take stuff from patients and put it back into them a little bit less uh, uh, than, or I should say a little bit more than, you know, having something off the shelf. Where's it all going to go? I don't know. And I honestly, sadly, it really depends on who lobbies the most, who throws the most money at it. And you know, who's going to do it? The biopharmaceutical companies. That's a new word, by the way, a biopharmaceutical company. It's a pharmaceutical company that specializes in biological products like amniotic tissue, umbilical cord tissue, uh, embryonic stem cells, all those things. I think they're just going to lobby and put a whole lot of money into uh, that system. And I think they'll probably win in the end just because that's the direction our country has gone with the uh, FDA and drugs. And so, you know, so we'll just, we'll adapt if we need to, but, uh, but I think long story short is regenerative medicine's here to stay. I think it's the next big phase. Uh, you know, I think of, you know, when surgery kind of came to the scene on, you know, as much as surgery can get a bad rap sometimes, surgery saves millions of lives every single, every single year. There are people who would not be alive today if they did not have certain surgeries. And so I look at this phase of regenerative medicine being akin to something like the introduction of pharmaceutical drugs or the introduction of surgery or something else that's just like, it's going to change a lot of lives. Will it have its downfalls? Of course, but is it going to change lives? Yeah, I really do believe that. Yeah, I started following an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Wade McKenna. Uh, mm, I think yeah. he's out of Texas. And, you know, he talks a lot about how uh, he had lumbar pain and some radicular pain. And so they went in, they fused him, and then his leg pain went away, but his back pain got worse. Mm. And so that woke him up to like, hey, you know, there's a better way. So I, I know probably three or four orthopedic surgeons now, they still do a little orthopedic surgery, but the majority of it is trying to keep people out of the OR because like Dr. McKenna says, people or patients will come in and ask him, am I really a candidate for stem cells? And he says, the better question is, are you a candidate for a major or highly invasive surgery? Right. Because even if you need the surgery, what's going to heal you? The stem cells, the growth factors, you know, the anabolic potential, all those things. Um, supplementation. Do you have any good supplement recommendations that you use on your patients postoperatively to help facilitate healing? Yeah. So biggest things that we incorporate. So from a nutritional standpoint is protein intake, just get more amino acids in. And so we try to shoot for a gram per pound of body weight. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody listening has any uh, major heart or kidney issues, please talk to your doctor about uh, protein consumption. But in general, we're looking for a gram per pound of body weight. So if, uh, you know, even if we have uh, an elderly lady and she is, you know, uh, 150 pounds and her kidneys are good, we're really going to try to push 150 grams of protein uh, because your body's going to want those amino acids to help with the repair process. Um, and so that's, that's the big number one thing. Um, vitamin C, it, we have found it to be extremely, extremely helpful in the recovery phase from these injections. Your body is going to um, need more of that vitamin C because vitamin C is used in the production of collagen. What, we're, what are we trying to do with these injections? We're trying to make more collagen. And so uh, we're going to want more of that. Generally, we're pushing a little bit higher than what most people think. Kind of a minimum we're looking at is three grams a day, upwards of sometimes eight to 10 grams a day, as long as patients can tolerate it with, with their gut, because some people that'll give them loose stools. Um, from there, we kind of start to move into a little bit more of the specialized type of supplement. So we use BPC-157 a lot. Uh, there's a product called Stem Regen, uh, which is a collection of herbs sourced from across the, the globe that actually stimulate the release of your own stem cells 
from the bone marrow, from your own bone marrow, that then travel through the blood. One of the fascinating things is that whenever we have an injury or we have surgery, our body is sending out signals to try to collect more healing resources to that area. And some of those signals are trying to call more stem cells to the area. And so we have absolutely been blown away at how well this supplement works in the like post-procedure period to the point where it's actually replaced BPC-157 as our primary post-procedure supplement to help with the repair process. And anybody who has ever watched anything of mine on YouTube knows how many videos I have on how great BPC is. Um, but uh, we've been using STEM Regen for about a year and a half now. And uh, it, is, uh, it has surpassed the what we were seeing with BPC for that post-operative period. Um, and the last one that we use is, uh, the main one is uh, a product called SPM Active, which is a concentration of pro-resolving mediators. It turns so, off the inflammatory response, right? It turns off the inflammatory response, which some people go, wait a minute, don't we want inflammation with PRP and stem cell therapy? And yes, we do. However, if you look at um, chronic injury, you look at the ability of children to heal, you take all this information. What I gather from it is that we want as humans a very strong inflammatory response for a very short period of time. And we do not want that to linger. And so what we do is starting three days after the procedure is when we start the pro resolving mediators to help the body resolve the inflammation from the injections. We come in with this big stimulus and then we really help to resolve that inflammation. And we find that that to be extremely, extremely helpful um, at you know just supporting that, that process that we're trying to go through, which is tissue healing. Absolutely. So how long have you been practicing total? Uh, I finished residency in 2018. So I graduated in 2017, finished in 2018. So we're seven, seven years at this point. What's something you know today you wish you would have known seven or eight years ago? Oh, man. Um, geez, I am learning new things all the time, Tim. That is a really hard question. Um, you know, uh, I think... I think, you know, seven years ago, I knew how powerful the regenerative medicine was. I still think I'm just in awe at, at, at how powerful it really, really, really is to the point where sometimes patients are like, okay, like I get it. It works. It's good. Like, you know, and I don't want to sound like, you know, we just tell everybody, hey, it works. What we talk about with patients is very data driven. Um, so actually, this is something that I do wish I had of. Um, that I think I wish was available seven, eight years ago. So there are two main companies out there who have what are called outcome registry tracking software, where they, we put all of our patients in and they send them surveys at predetermined times. And it's a way for us to look at our outcomes with our patients for certain um, age brackets, for certain disease conditions, for certain regions of the body, for different biologics that we're using. But then we also have access to look at their whole database which at this point I think is something to the effect of like 15,000 patients. So it is like a, it's a huge database to be able to look at, hey, in general, how well is PRP working for patients who have end-stage knee osteoarthritis in terms of pain and ability to, you know, get around through the day, like functional assessments and things like that. I wish we had that seven, eight years ago because we use that in talking with our patients to be like, hey, this is what our clinic does. This is what we see. This is what the national database looks like. Here's kind of the middle of the road average of what we can expect. And then we, you know, get into some really big nuances with that. So that way we can tell them, hey, look, this thing here, there's only a 50% chance that within three months, you're going to be about 30% better, but there is a good surgical option. You know, you might want to consider that. Now, you know, someone might just say, I understand. I accept those, those numbers. I accept those risks. This is, you know, my finances that I want to put towards this. And I go, okay, that's reasonable. You get to, this is a free country. You get to decide, you know, there's a non-life-threatening condition. Um, and other people go, you know what, doc, thanks. Like I've kind of been on the fence about surgery and I think I'm just, you know, knowing that 
I don't want to spend this amount of money and then potentially still need surgery because my out of pocket deductible is going to be 10,000. And so, you know, that would just be really hard financially. So I'm just, I'm going to go have the surgery and I'll go, great. I'm glad we could just help in the decision-making process. So I wish I had that information and data available seven, eight years ago. We just, we just didn't, it just didn't exist. Absolutely. And if people, do you have people fly in from out of state or drive in from out of state? Yeah, probably right now, I'd say probably about 40 to 50%, depending on the month of our patients come from out of state or out of country to, to work with us. Awesome. And where can yeah. people find you if they want to do a consultation and consider coming to Arizona? Yeah, so if, um, if people want to learn more, the two probably, um, well, the biggest platform for me and where I'm most active is going to be Instagram. Um, the place that is easiest to learn more is YouTube. And that's just because I have, I think at this point, like 1,400 or 1,700 videos on YouTube. And so wow. you can search my channel on like low back pain or PRP or, you know, BPC, whatever it is, people can search and then they can, they can learn. Um, and then our website, regenerativeperformance.com is, uh, is where people can learn more about the practice. Um, they can schedule a free kind of 15 minute call to see if we're a good fit to work together. Um, or they can just, uh, you know, get that contact information from there, call the clinic and set up an appointment. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Your patients are very lucky to have both you and your wife. And hopefully we can have you back on in the future for some more regenerative medicine updates. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. All right. Take care.